This program is made possible through generous donations from viewers like you. To pledge your support, please visit arootawakening.tv slash give. Thank you. Every time the last words of a man of God are recorded in the scriptures, we are led into an understanding that can be found no other way. It was Moses in his last words where he said to guard, stand over, protect the Sabbath. Guard the month of the Aviv, the Creator's calendar. The feast of the Lord we are to watch over and protect. And we are to guard in reverence, hear and obey the words of the prophet, the prophet who will hear directly from heaven and he will correct our ways. It is the words of the prophet, Yeshua, and his final words that he declared to the nation of Israel that we find the essence of the gospel of the kingdom. Through all of Yeshua's ministry, everything that he said and everything that he did was a declaration of the gospel of the kingdom, which is the Torah, the living Torah, and its application to our lives. Yeshua took us right back to Moses and said, obey what Moses says to do. Do not follow the Takanot, the man-made rules of the religious system of his day or of our day. And we go right back to the beginning when Moses says, guard, guard the Sabbath. Because now, the sun is set at the end of the sixth day. It is now the Sabbath day, the day that we were told to respect, to honor, to keep holy, and to guard and protect with everything that we've got. And so now we begin the Sabbath with Shabbat Night Live. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom to our fans. Welcome to another sweltering Shabbat Night Live here in the Buckle of the Bible Belt, Charlotte, North Carolina. And please help welcome my guest host, Annie Reed. Annie. I'm glad to be here in well, this wonderful heat. Summer's <laughs> almost over. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. You just got a couple of weeks, and mm -hmm. the children will be back in school, and we'll be back. Uh, uh, we, we've got some hot stuff coming up with oh, yeah. Nehemia in the Karite files. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, this is going to be the debate of the century here. Absolutely, it's a Shabbat Night Live series that you don't want to miss. It's actually going to be a two-month process or a two-month uh, show, just about. So you don't want to miss it. You want to be here. You want to hear it live, and you want to participate as much as you can. Yeah, that's right. So. Uh, as the director of ministry development, what's developing? Tell us what's <laughs> going on out there. This is where I find out what's going on, folks. I have no idea. She tells me, I come in. Okay, what's going on, Annie? Well, we're certainly excited about the changes that will be coming to um, Shabbat Night Live in itself. I know that in the past, we've had a lot of great guests on the show, mm -hmm. um, and we look forward to having a lot of great guests in the near future as well. That's right. Now, uh, th this last year, that's when we started adding in, you know, experts in the field, and that's what we were really looking for. Uh, you know, Tim Mahoney spent 12 years doing the research, the background on Israel's exodus out of Egypt. You know, he, he um, uh, uh, Perez, he, he uh, interviews Netanyahu, mm -hmm. uh, some of the leading archaeologists in the land of Israel. We had him in for not only Shabbat Night Live, but an entire weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, we brought in also David Roll, the Egyptologist who was featured in Patterns of Evidence, which is Tim Mahoney's movie on, I believe I have right here. Uh, here is uh, Tim Mahoney. The, uh, you never know where a crisis of faith will lead you. And uh, uh, this is something that uh, I, I got involved uh, really 
uh, with, with Tim, uh, now I believe it's 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I just came in from Egypt. I was at the Christian Booksellers Convention, and I said, Tim, they found uh, uh, hundreds of Egyptian chariots on the bottom of the Red Sea. They got on video and said, you got to get involved with this. I do television. You know, but this takes a filmmaker, and he was the president of the American Christian Filmmakers Association. Well, that led him on a journey that when he came in, we had we had a weekend to to that I will always remember. It was, it was wonderful. I believe uh, that 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 is uh, available uh, to our our audience out there. We also had uh, David Roll, the Egyptologist, who cracked the uh, the Karnak. Uh, inscription uh, that had been misread a hundred years ago that threw everything into a tailspin. He corrected that, and so uh, then we brought in Jim and Penny Caldwell, the American oil field engineers who made 15 individual trips to Mount Sinai. Uh, over nine years, they, uh, they were able to secure just you know, numerous artifacts, the video footage, all the stuff that, that we have, the, everything that Ron Wyatt ever had to show of his adventure there, uh, they provided to him. Uh, Bob Cornuke and Larry Williams, even though it's uh, now uh, doubtful that they were ever there, uh, yet they at least used their Jim and Penny's footage uh, to try to weave a story that uh, that, that all fell apart uh, right after their New York Times bestseller uh, finally tanked. But anyway, uh, you know, we, we have people that have used their stuff, and they gave me uh, free access to, to everything to help get the true message out there. And so I was very thankful for that. So we've had a number Number of people that uh, that have been on. Oh, uh, we've had uh, uh, Miles Jones yes, of Jones's have. Geniuses. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been on with us, and uh, and uh, oh, who could forget Kent Hovind, <laughs> Doctor Dino himself. And I hope to have Kent uh, on some more. Uh, just a a, a a wonderful brother, a brilliant man, just a just a saint. I, I just love Kent and and what he's doing for this generation and the future generations to wake them up to the truth of, of the scriptures. So, um, so we, we've got some other things, uh, other other people that are line, lining up here yes. uh, that are experts in their particular fields, Correct. right? Correct, and I don't want to give anything away, but they are experts in their field, but they're also, uh, a handful of them are archeologists, uh, authors, theologians, just people that are just, we have scientists uh, that could possibly come on the show. So I, like I said, I don't want to give anything away. Yeah, but we do have, Nehemi Gordon. Oh yes, I know. We're only a couple of weeks away. Bear so this, with this us. is where it really kind of starts off. We're kicking this thing off with Nehemi, and uh, uh, th this should be a real hoot. And who wouldn't want to watch it after the Q and A's? I mean, mm -hmm. incredible, yeah. incredible stuff. So we're excited. It's the end of the month. We only have a few days left for the love gift. Uh, speaking of love gift, I have it right here again. Uh, this is a month, the sweltering month in which Yeshua is training his disciples, uh, training and then sending out his disciples. So this is the calling and sending, the calling and sending. And this is one of the most important parts of the entire New Testament, this period of time here, uh, that, you know, mo most people, because there is there are no big miracles that are happening that are uh, you know, just so pronounced that they can make a Bible story out of it, but it's actually what Yeshua is training his disciples in, mm -hmm. teaching them the difference between the man-made religion of the Pharisees back in his day. You know, you could you could just name 33 denominations, 33,000 denominations mm -hmm. today, but Phariseeism was the predominant religion in the land of Israel at that time. And what they did is no different from every Christian denomination out there today. It's just a different pope, a different, uh, you know, the head rabbi or whatever. But Yeshua is really clarifying the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the rules of the kingdom and the rules of man-made religion. And so this is my joy to be able to share this with you on the level that I teach it. This is not going to be out in YouTube. We're not putting it out there to the masses because most of them, they're just... They would never get it, okay? Honestly, they just wouldn't get it. It would go right over their head. This is for the people that stand with us in ministry, that donate, uh, and what we set this as $50 uh, for, for this, a donation of fifty dollars that allows us to get it out there. You say, well, this this isn't you know this is like an hour and a, the fifteen minutes, hour and a half, uh, fifty dollars. Uh, right, you're right. This is worth probably probably a hundred dollars. 
but this is my gift to you. That's what it is, all right? I get you to uh, come into the tent of Abraham with me, and I get to tell you the stories on a very deep level, and so $50 or more, and then if you would like the mezuzah, uh, the beautiful um, metallic mezuzah, and it actually has, are these amber? This looks like uh, yellow diamonds. It looks like yellow diamonds, okay? That's what it looks like. I don't know if you can get the glint out there, but it's really beautiful. And then we have a roll your own Torah scroll uh, that you can put in and attach it to the doorpost to your house. And uh, and this is your, your proclamation that he is the head of your house. And so we, we offer this a gift of $100 or more for the entire package. And I think you have a way for people on the website to subscribe if they want to start getting them all. That's right. You just have to go to our website at rootawakening.tv, go right to our store. And as you used to do before, you would just subscribe to a reoccurring donation to receive the monthly love gift. And uh, you also have the opportunity to receive any and all love gifts that we've had in the past that are no longer available. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those opportunities will present themselves throughout the year. That's right. For you and your household. And uh, now we can't guarantee the, that you get the, the love gift, the additional love gift Correct. on that, but the teaching, that's the most important part, people. And, uh, and I, I can even say that one hour is just packed of information. Uh, you can't even tell it's an hour's worth. So, I mean, you really will sit there and study. You go through the chronological gospels. You go into every single detail and verse just about. So... It's, it's yeah. a great teaching. Yeah. yeah, I came back. I was I was watching. I was in Israel when Scott was doing an opening for me and was talking about the love gift. He says it's only a half hour long. I said, a half hour long? Are you out of your mind? And I said, go check and see how long that is. And he came back. I said, it was uh, over an hour and 10 minutes. It just felt like a half hour. I said, okay, that's different. It's like, man, I am sweating at the end. It's like everything I've got, I put into this because I love to do this. Mm -hmm. People, I am so thankful that I'm alive, that I, I am here to be able to, to share these truths with you because I, you know, I, I just don't know if I ever would ever get to share the, the, the gospel of the kingdom that is in here um, you know, I, I know when I was uh, 40 years old, I was still clueless on just most of this stuff, even though I've been searching for it my entire life. Well, okay. and for me, I went to seminary, was born Catholic, raised Catholic, went Mormon, went to seminary, and, um, and then went into the Worldwide Church of God. And that's where I came out of for Hebrew roots. And I feel like I'm starting over even now, 10 years later after keeping Torah, I'm, uh, I feel yeah. like I'm starting over, relearning my faith and relearning a lot of things that I didn't know before. Well, you know, that, that's, that, that's interesting. I, I forgot about the, the fact that you are in Worldwide Church mm -hmm. of God. Um, you know, it was a number of years ago uh, over in Israel, we had a, a tour of 52 people, and that's generally where we put, uh, you know, with, the, with the, uh, uh, the, the, the biggest coach, that's where we put the lid. I don't do any more than that because I want to be personal. I, I spend my life, I put every bit of energy into the thing, and, uh, you know, I've, I've walked away exhausted, almost crippled after a tour just because it's like I get this one chance to change these people's lives forever. I remember we were down at the, the Dead Sea. We were down at uh, a kibbutz, and, and it was a night where everyone just shared where they came from. Out of that group of 52, 33 people came from Worldwide Church wow. of God. Had no idea, and so I started asking uh, more about it, and, and it turned out that Herbert Armstrong, Correct. he was the one that founded this, and, and uh, he taught people about the Sabbath and about mm -hmm. the feast, and then I went and I, I looked at some of his stuff, and I thought, you know, for a Gentile, he did a pretty good job. Absolutely, that's why I say I learned the basics, and then you yeah. gave yeah. me all and of these. Yeah, got some real, real basics there, and that, that's why I say, you know, after uh, seeing some of what Herbert Armstrong did, um, it's like, you know, well, you know, good start, but, you know, let Jews yeah. interpret the scriptures the Jews have written. And, you know, you don't get a lot of Gentile stuff uh, mixed in with it. But uh, what, what happened a number of years later, somebody else comes into the head of this thing and then takes everything and goes right back into Babylonian sun worship, you know, it basically, uh, you know, back into Catholicism. And I, I couldn't believe it that, uh, you know, I heard the story that most of the people stayed. 
Yes. And then, then a thousand groups broke off from them. And I thought, that's the way it needs to be. The people that are just in there for the social function care, care less about the truth. You go in there and take everything they've learned and tear it away from them, and they're just going to hang out still. That's they, right. they don't care about the truth. They just have a comfortable religion. So, you know, let them go to hell. I mean, that's where religion takes everyone. It's the broad path that leads to destruction. And so the ones that broke off, you know, some of them just kept on mouthing the same things. Others opened up, and you did. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, you opened up, okay, you know, there, there's more here, and you kept on searching for the truth. Ended up going to, you know, seminary and, and really, you know, and so this is quite a testimony. So you come full circle all the way around to, you know, and had a rude awakening of your own there. Absolutely. And I'm still having it on a daily basis. Every time I pick up the scriptures, <laughs> I'm learning something new. So, and that's why I'm so grateful. We have such good teachings on Roku that are available. You can see the the archive of Shabbat Night Live after this live session ends, right after actually. Right, right, right afterwards, and then it, it goes bam, right up on, on Roku. That's uh, right. HD, you can watch it there. Our mm. Bible study, and of course, A Rude Awakening from Israel, the eight classics, and we're just very excited. A lot of people are finding A Rude Awakening through Roku. Well, so we appreciate the partners that stand with us, that donate, that give above and beyond to be a part of this ministry. And yes, I, and I thank you. And, that, and this is my way of say, saying thank you, folks. Really, I, you know, because uh, you know, someone else helped me get to you. You are now helping me to get to other people. And we need this thing to keep on going. I need the people who have been with me 20 years ago keep on standing with me. I'm, I'm still doing what I'm doing. People have tried to take me down. They tried to take over. They tried to uh, to steal things from me in the in the past, and to you know, literally try to attempted to steal all my intellectual property and. So I said, okay, you, you think you've got the right, we'll, uh, we'll take it to a judge. And uh, they ended up with nothing, and I'm getting this out to the whole world. They didn't want me to put it up free of charge on the internet. That's what they didn't want to do, because they thought that they were just going to bankroll their, their dreams on my shoulders. And you know? that's... That's why you got the last word, just like our teaching. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> our teaching Famous for last words. This is where we're starting tonight, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. These are extremely important. And, and when, you know, when Peter gives his last words, and he says this, this very thing, he says, Yeshua showed me that I'm going to die soon. Okay, so I need you to put you in remembrance of these things, and what he lays down are really the foundations of where I go with this entire series on power-filled abundant living. We have the first 10 episodes that are now available for you. This is going to continue on because we've got another 10 episodes that are ready to go to teach you the, the foundations of how the scriptures interpret itself. But this is where it all starts out, ladies and gentlemen, the famous last words we have Moses, we have King David, we have Peter, we have Yeshua. And these words, understood in context, are, are something that is like the last words. If there's anything you've got to understand, these are it. Grab a hold of these things. And so uh, this is available just the first session tonight. This is $34.95. $34.95. We want you to get the whole thing and make it part of your library. And not just to put it on a shelf. I want you to watch it. I want you to study it. I want you to get your friends and family. I want your V fellowships, just like with our, our, um, our monthly love gift. Get your V fellowships together and study this once every month. Discuss it and then get the same message out to the rest of the world. That's your job. I'm doing mine. Thanks for staying with me and we will get this to happen. Now we've got Nehemiah that's going to be with us in just a few moments for our questions and answers and he'll be with us in a couple weeks to start out our experts in the field. He is the foremost scholar of the Hebrew roots of the faith in the world today, and he's with us. Can't wait for this. We'll be back right after a word for our sponsors, you out there. The third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, took a knife to his Bible and began to remove certain passages from the pages. The passages were the miracles of Yeshua, but why would he do that? Michael Rood believes this to be very important for the Christian world. The Christian world looks at the miracles as Yeshua's only ministry. But if you took out all the miracles, then all you would have left is Yeshua's teaching. 
Miracles are the proof from heaven, and for Yeshua's ministry, they were proof that the Almighty was endorsing him as Messiah. But this was only the beginning. If you take out the miracles, you leave Christianity or churchianity without anything because they pay no attention to what Yeshua says. This month, for your donation of $50 or more, Michael Rood would like to bless you with a new teaching, The Calling and Sending. This never-before-seen teaching will challenge what you understand about the miracles of Yeshua and the calling of His people. The miracles are not the proof that He's the Messiah. The miracles are the proof that what he says as the prophet, he has the authority to say it, heaven is endorsing it. And that is the significance of these very miracles. And if you donate $100 or more, you will also receive this beautiful mezuzah for your home. The mezuzah is a piece of parchment inscribed with verses from the Torah, encased in a beautiful pewter scroll. Place it on your doorpost as a reminder that you and your household serve the Almighty. Don't miss this opportunity. Call now or visit us online to receive The Calling and Sending Collection, Episode 8 of Michael Rood's 20-episode Love Gift Teaching Series. A couple days ago, I was in the far end of the house doing laundry, and the walls began shaking with the most uproarious laughter. I couldn't figure out what was going on. I didn't know if somehow a, a, a television or the internet came on. I went over there, and Nehemiah Gordon was uh, was right back in my reclining chair with a book in his hand and shaking the walls with laughter. As a matter of fact, uh, it, it, it triggered an asthma attack. He was laughing so hard, and I said, what are you reading? And he said, it's Lou White's book on who is Allah. Yeah. And uh, so, so uh, I said, okay, you got to share the joke or whatever is going on here. Well, and, 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 and all, in all seriousness, I have my ventil in here because I'm concerned that when I read this again, it'll trigger another asthma attack. It, <laughs> I'll laugh out so hard. But, but I also thought it's worth sharing what it says here and, and explaining just how fundamentally wrong this is when it comes to explaining the Hebrew language. And, and that, that was really the issue. I mean, right, you're, right. you're reading... Uh, oh, he, he's, a, a he's, he's explaining things here about the Hebrew language that are just so fundamentally wrong, just, just such fundamental misunderstandings of how the language works that uh, it's worth explaining because there's people who then... I know I get emails from people who will say, you know, uh, you know, things based on this and saying, but that's how it works in Hebrew. And I'm like, no, I don't even know where to begin. Like, so now I know where to begin. Here's what he writes. He writes, the Hebrew word Allah, Aleph, Lam, and He is not associated with Islam, although that may be the first reaction when we see the spelling Allah rather than the traditional Ella. So I, I, I don't even know what he's talking about with Ella. There is no such, I mean, the word Ella in Hebrew means, means rather or but, has nothing to do with God. Like, what is he even talking about? He says, and then he goes on to say, the Pharisees did not twist the letter Aleph into Ayan. There's no Ayan in, in Elohim. So I don't even, like, this is just bizarre. It was twisted by a Karaite sect called the Masoretes. <laughs> okay, the Masoretes were Jewish scribes who copied the Bible. The Hebrew Bible we have today comes from the Masoretes. Some were Karaites and some weren't. Some were Rabbinites. And okay, scholars. So it's, a, it's, it's across the board Karaites and Maser Rabbinites both. Masoret was a profession. That would be like saying, um, you know, I'm a fireman, you know. It's not a it's not a, a, a religious affiliation. It was a profession. The masterites were the people who they were the scribes who copied the Bible that we have today. Now he goes on. He says this uh, right, here. He says um, this sect of masterites, which isn't a sect, did not want anyone uttering the true name Yud Hey Ua U Hey as Yahuwah. So they invented vowel distortions with Nikud and cantillation marks to train those reading Hebrew to mispronounce words. Allahim became Elohim. What? No, no, no. Allahim was never a word in Hebrew. That's in a made up Hebrew that comes from the state of Tennessee. It was never a, a pronunciation of the Hebrew language. He, he's confusing Arabic and Hebrew and thinking these masterites who copied the Bible that they made up the vowels. That's complete nonsense. What many scholars say 
and this is a matter of contention, but what many scholars say is the Masoretes wrote down the vowels. No scholars say that the Masoretes invented the vowels. The vowels existed way before the Masoretes, and in fact, in my book, Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence, I bring the example where Rabbi Akiva, in the year 90 AD or 89, he talks about changing the vowels of a certain word from reading it atem to, o, from otam to atem. So they had vowels back then in 90 AD. Um, whether they were written down or not, that's a matter of debate. But the vowels were fixed back then to the point where you could talk about changing the vowels. So this is mm -hmm. a complete fundamental misunderstanding of the Hebrew language. No one created vowels to, to change the pronunciation. And certainly for the word Elohim, why would anybody ever change that? There was never a ban on speaking the word Elohim that means God. This is just, he's just making stuff up, literally making stuff up. He goes on, Yahoo became Yeho. No, there's Yahoo at the end of names. Like Elijah is Eliyahu. Isaiah is Yeshayahu. Yeho is at the beginning of names. That's not a matter of dispute. Joshua is Yehoshua. I've got a cousin it's named- It's universal. I got a I cousin named Joshua. Mm -hmm. And here's the really funny thing. He's saying that these Karite Jews who were masterites made up the vowels. Then why does the Talmud have vowels? The earliest manuscripts of the Mishnah have vowels. The rabbinical prayer book, the Siddur, has vowels. Was that made up by Karaites? It's the rabbinical Mishnah, the rabbinical Siddur. You know, the Karaites had no interest in that whatsoever. Some of them actually have cantillation marks as well, um, which are not just for cantillation, they, they had all kinds of functions. Um, Anyway, he says, they left the name Abraham alone, otherwise it would be Ebrahim today. He, he seems confused between the pronunciation of the letter Aleph and the letter Ayan. The letter Ayan properly is a guttural letter, so it's like, ah, it's, it's hard for, so actually Yeshua is actually Yeshua. It's a letter that's difficult for Americans to say, but it's part of the Hebrew language. He seems to think the ayin is an a and the aleph is an a. Ah. He's confusing consonants with vowels, which is just, I, I don't know what to say about that. that. That makes me laugh. That gives me an asthma attack. It's funny. Um, and then he says this great thing. He says the Hebrew root al became el. Wait, wait, roots can't change what do you, if it's an aleph. And, uh, and he says this root is not a, a name of any kind. It is a pronoun uh, implying lofty, upward, highness, strength, mightiness. The airline El Al means to go upwards. El, and he says El Al is spelled I and Lamed, Aleph Lamed. It's actually the other way around. So, I mean, this is, I, I don't even, like he's basing this on the airline El Al. He literally seems to be basing this on, he found out there's an Israeli airline. He was confused at how the name of the airline was spelled in Hebrew, and based on that, he's developed a doctrine of how to say the word for God in Hebrew, which is Elohim. The singular is Eloah, um, and he seems to think that's Allah because of the Israeli airline, which he got confused. I mean, Michael, <laughs> help me out here. I'm afraid I can't help you, and, and, uh, and I think uh, you're the only one that uh, knows enough about Hebrew to laugh as loud as you did about this. I mean, he talks here things that are, that are, are just, uh, he talks here, let me read this. He says, Yishma'alites and Yasharalites are both Hebrews. And by Yishma'alites, I think he means Yishma'elim, or Ishmaelites, meaning the Arabs. He's saying the Arabs are Hebrews. No, the Arabs are not Hebrews. The Arabs, according to their own tradition, are Ishmaelites. Um, whether they're actually Ishmaelites or not is, is a, a valid historical question. Mm -hmm. But why would he call the Israelites Yasharalites? So what he's done is he's stripped the Hebrew language of any historical pronunciation and now turned the word Yisrael into Yasharal. Michael, I've made jokes about this thing in the past and said if you didn't have the vowels of the Hebrew language, you would think the word Yisrael was Yasharal, and he's actually literally done it. I, I don't wow. know what to do, Michael. <laughs> Okay, well, that's, um, that's, uh, that's a beautiful thing. Well, oh th th this, uh, this comes a question that we had uh, that really it turns out to be related. I don't understand the Bible. Where do I begin? This is really yeah. the question. And uh, so <laughs> Genesis 1-1, and I would say along with Genesis 1-1, ask the Father, the creator of the universe, to help you understand it as you're reading. Mm -hmm. Prayer mm -hmm. and study. You know, work it out for yourself in fear and trembling with prayer and study before the Lord.
Um, okay, we got another one here, uh, Nehemiah. Um, mm. uh, you know, I, I think the, uh, this deserves, we need to go into the, uh, the Vav, Ye- Yehovah, the oh, okay. Vav and the Wav. Uh, but let's, let's do that next time. Right. Uh, you know, okay. c- come back, let's, right. uh, we don't know. I, I think this was a great introduction because there are people who are very openly basing their pronunciation of Hebrew on Arabic and claiming the Arabs are actually Hebrews when they're not. Arabic is a bastardized form of Hebrew that was created at the Tower of Babel. The original language before the flood was Hebrew. I can prove that from the mm-hmm. names they have. Adam is a Hebrew word, and Chava is a Hebrew word. That's a Hebrew word for Eve. And they all have meanings in Hebrew. They don't work in other languages. Um, and, what, and what happened is the languages were confused and scattered, and, and new uh, corrupt forms of those languages were the confused. The Babel form of Hebrew is Arabic and Aramaic. Those are Babel languages. Um, and if you take Hebrew and try to pronounce it as Arabic, you're going to get ridiculous things like Yahuwah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll dig into some of those uh, uh, as we go on. And, uh, oh, you know what? We have run out of time. We're, you're going to have to come back and uh, next week right. uh, for our questions to cyberspace. I have several here, but uh, let, let's tackle the next one, which is the, the Vav in the pronunciation of the name. We'll handle that when we uh, get back together next time for our questions to cyberspace. But right now, we have a message for those of you who are in cyberspace. We'll be back in just a moment. Wonderful. <laughs> Michael Rood's Message of Truth is broadcast all over the world, but none of it happens without the monthly financial support of our Ambassador Club members. And right now, membership has more benefits than ever. I'm giving into a ministry that is helping to feed other people that have the same hunger that I do. Join now and Michael Rood will send you the Ambassador Club Welcome Kit, an exclusive messenger bag stocked with teaching DVDs, Red Sea crossing cards, and more. You'll also receive ambassador-only bonus gifts whenever you make a separate donation to receive the monthly love gift. Best of all, you'll get ambassador-only sale prices in our online bookstore several times throughout the year. Plus, exclusive invitations to Ambassador Club functions at Arute Awakening events. All it takes is a modest commitment of $100 per month or an annual gift of $1,200. Call now or visit the Arute Awakening website to join the Ambassador Club. Your support of Arute Awakening International spreads the truth to others and inspires testimonies from all over the world. The truths that you teach have been eye-opening for my wife and I. We now know more about the scripture than we have since coming to know Yeshua. We now walk in a new freedom that we've never walked in before. Call now or visit our website to support A Root Awakening International. Thank you. Traditions that we inherited from Babylon through Constantine have us occasionally with a little plastic cup and a little round wafer in a church service having what is called communion. But Yeshua was not having communion with his disciples. It was the last meal before his crucifixion, which happened at the time the Passover lambs were being sacrificed the following morning. Yeshua took this opportunity to explain something that had been embedded in the the Israelite culture for then over a thousand years. Mel Exotic brought forth bread and wine to Abraham and he blessed the Most High saying, Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, HaMotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Yeshua said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. As often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. And so we break this bread and we do it in remembrance of him. Likewise, Yeshua took the cup and he blessed the most high with that blessing that Melchizedek blessed the most high. Baruch Atah Yehovah. Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pari Hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, the King of the universe, 
the creator of the fruit of the vine. Yeshua said, this represents my shed blood, which will be poured out for the remission of sin. I will not drink another drop of the fruit of the vine. You take my cup and divide it among yourselves because I won't drink it until I drink it again with you in my Father's kingdom. The marriage supper of the Lamb, Yeshua will lift this cup and he will say, Lahai to life everlasting. And until then, we remember what he's done and remember that marriage supper of the Lamb. Get ready. Thank you for watching our broadcast. If you are enjoying this, click the subscribe button below this video. By subscribing to our channel, you will receive immediate updates on new videos we post in the future. Now, back to the teaching. Have a blessed time. This is the first series, the first episode in the series, The Famous Last Words of Moses. Whenever we get the opportunity to read the last words of anyone in the scripture, we see a culmination of a person's life, all their wisdom, and what the Almighty wants them to communicate in the very last words, their last breath in this life. Not all the time do we hear great words of wisdom from those with which we are accompanying at the time of their death, but when we read the words of King David, and these are recorded for us, we are giving, being given instruction here that is being passed on down to Solomon his son. And so please turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23, and we are going to begin reading in verse 1. These are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed by the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, and this is you know, going back and just grabbing every but bit of his life. First of all, he is the son of Jesse. He was a man that was made king and anointed by the God of Israel. He was the sweet psalmist of Israel and prophesied and set in place the temple liturgy. David's temple liturgy was put in place before there was a temple. And at the time of Hezekiah and Josiah, uh, hundreds of years into the future, we see that it is uh, those kings, when they celebrated the Feast of Passover, they celebrated according to all the ordinances of King David, because David, as Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Shavuot, that David was a prophet who saw beforehand the coming of the Messiah. David had to have revelation for him as the king to go in before the Ark of the Covenant when it was finally brought up correctly on the shoulders of the priest from Shiloh to Jerusalem. When he tried it the first time, he did it illegally. He put it on his own ox cart, he danced before the ox cart, and because of that, a priest ended up dead. Then, after it stayed, the ark stayed in the house of Obed-Edom for a period of time, and King David saw how blessed Obed-Edom was, then he determined that he was going to do it correctly. And so he did it correctly. So David had to have revelation or he would have been dead approaching the ark, going in before the ark of the covenant, he being a king and not the priest. And so now David, who by revelation writes these Psalms and prophesies concerning the coming Messiah, who saw beforehand, such as Psalm 22, saw the crucifixion of Yeshua and described it in, in such detail that Yeshua actually quotes it from the cross himself. And people are watching it as it unfolds right there before their eyes. This is the one who said, verse two, the spirit of Yehovah spake by me. He spake by me. And in other words, just as Peter said, he was moved by the spirit of God and he spoke and his word was in my tongue. And there is nothing greater in life than to experience that you are actually speaking 
revelation from heaven that has been given to you so that you can put that out and that it can be grasped, that it can be held onto. And this is the sweet psalmist, this is what he is saying, that the spirit of Yehovah spake by me, his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake to me. The rock, the rock, the rock. And we're going to see this very thing that, that this rock is referring to the Messiah. And that is why Moses was not allowed to go in the promised land because he was told the first time to strike the rock. 40 years later, when they were thirsty again, he was told to declare the rock. But instead of declaring the rock, he struck it again. And for that reason, both he and Aaron were forbidden from going into the promised land because they destroyed the prophetic shadow picture of the Messiah as the rock who was to be smitten once and then declared. Because he didn't declare him, we didn't get to see the full picture of the Messiah. He destroyed it. And that is why he was forbidden from going in. But David said, I spoke to the rock. This rock spoke to me. And this is what is recorded, the last words of King David. He that rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of Almighty God. You have to respect him, you have to fear him, you have to know that he has your life in his hands. And when you understand that you are there, and just like Nebuchadnezzar, which would happen generations later, just like this, the words that came out of his mouth, bam, he lost his mind for seven years, chained like an animal to a stump outdoors. His nails, fingernails, grew like, a, like an eagle's fingernails. An absolute madman, and that is how close any of us are for our lights to go out. And, and you must be just, he that rules over men. These words are particularly important for Solomon, his son, who will rule over men, listen up. And he, he, that rules over men, in the fear of God shall be as the light of the morning. When the sun rises, even a clear morning without clouds after the rain, and as the tender grass springing out of the earth with its dew drops glistening in the morning sun. He is going to be refreshing. He will be a ruler who is refreshing to the soul, who will provide insight and wisdom, such as Solomon did in the, the incident in which the two women came before him with a, a child. They issued the child and with his wisdom from above, Solomon said, okay, no fighting over this baby. He called for a swordsman, cut the baby in half and give each one half. And one woman said, that's just. The other one said, no, give the baby to the other woman. Solomon said, that is a true mother. See, that was a refreshing. To, to have a man of that wisdom sitting in the throne of Israel who is ruling justly, that is like the dew, dew drops glistening in the morning sun. And David has to confess, although my house may not be right with God, and he knows that, that something is desperately wrong because of the entire attempt of Adoniah, his son. Adoniah, which is Yah is my Lord, Yah is my Lord, even though he had the right name, he attempted to usurp the throne, and because of that, we're gonna see that Solomon later has to put him to death because he can't be trusted. He is a liar, he is a thief, he's doing anything he can behind the scenes. It wasn't obvious at first. If it were, David could have taken care of it, but no, no, he then started to, to mount his attack. And so he knows that his house is not right. Yet he hath made me an everlasting covenant. And David was given the kingdom forever and his offspring by a covenant of salt. Not a blood covenant, but a covenant of salt. He is uh, he, uh, ordered, ordered, it's, everything is in order and sure because of this covenant that he made. This covenant is my salvation and all my desire, everything I could desire is wrapped up in this covenant the Almighty made with me. Even though I know my family, some of them, they're in a mess but yet I know that he is the one that made the covenant, for he shall make my house to grow. But all the sons of Belial are like thorns that must be uprooted. 
And any time we see the terminology sons of Belial, we, we are dealing with, number one, we're dealing with sexual perversion. We are dealing more often with liars, people who have no conscience who will lie and deceive people in order to get what they want out of life. These are the sons of Belial. They are deceivers, they're tricksters. They are ones that will violate the commandments of the Almighty in order to get what they want. The sons of Belial are like thorns that must be uprooted. These are the last words. Listen, these are the words that, that Solomon has to hear. And we need to hear these things because human nature doesn't change. There's nothing new under the sun, which doesn't mean that everything that's happening now what happened once before, and it's just repeating, no. There's nothing new under the sun in that the sons of Belial are like thorns, they must be uprooted, be careful. They cannot be taken with bare hands. In other words, this is not just a job for the flesh. The, the man that handles them must be protected with an iron glove and must use the long staff of a spear. That's how the sons of Belial must be taken care of. He shall utterly destroy them wherever they grow. And one of the first things that Solomon did after the death of his father David is he went out and he sent his men out and he killed the sons of Belial, the ones that he knew were going to fight against him, the ones that had turned their back on David, he knew that they would come after him. And so when his wisdom, that he prayed to the Almighty, he gave him wisdom, and the wisdom, first of all, came because the rock told Solomon, what, excuse me, David, what to tell his son. And so the sons of Belial in the religious system are the same way today, ladies and gentlemen. They are thorns. They have to be uprooted. But you have to be careful. You can't handle them with bare hands. They have to be handled in the spirit. And you have to respond by the spirit. You have to be able to receive word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, and then exercise, faith, miracles, gifts of healing. The, these are the things that, that the Spirit of the Almighty within, that is how these things have to be handled. The man that handles them has to be protected with an iron glove and use the long staff of a spear. And he has to utterly destroy them where they go. And that's why we see when we get into the last words in the epistles, especially with Peter, that he has to use a iron glove and a long staff of a spear because of the pseudo-propheticos, the false prophets and the false apostles that have invaded the body of believers. This is what Jude has to handle in his statement because evil men had crept in, turned the grace of God into license. They are evil, they are evil. They are sons of Belial and they have to be handled by the spirit and they have to be uprooted. They have to be handled with an iron glove, a long staff of a spear and they have to be destroyed. And the Almighty is the one who brings all this in his judgment. It's when the rock speaks, then the rockets better listen. Now I'd like to go to 2 Peter, the last words of Peter. We've handled some of these things in our previous series. Wherefore, and again, whenever you see the wherefore, you have to ask why for the wherefore? What's the therefore, therefore? Why for the wherefore? Wherefore means why, why is it, okay? Or this is why, this is why I will not be negligent. This is uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you already know them, and are established in the present truth. And this, this term, established in the present truth, see, all of the scripture is truth. Yeshua is truth but it is the truth that is reality and present right now that we are led into. And that is what, that, that puts us on the cutting edge. What is the present truth? What are we supposed to be doing now to get the gospel of the kingdom out to the world? This is the, the question for us. There is a present truth, something that is presently before us that we must focus in on and we cannot get sidetracked, and this is what the sidetrack is happening here in the very first, first century. 
Yea, I think it meet, it's appropriate as long as I'm in this body, tabernacle, to stir you up, putting you in remembrance, knowing, knowing, and this is what he knows, that I shortly must put off this, my tabernacle. I'm going to die, okay? Let's make it real plain. I'm going to die. Yeshua, the rock, has showed me that I am going to die. Moreover, I'll endeavor, I'll do my best to, that, that you may be able, after I die, to always have these things in remembrance. And so that's why he's writing them down. Remember, remember, remember. Because we have not followed cunningly devised fables. And he's gonna go on because there are others, that's exactly what they did. That one line, he's gonna spend a chapter, an entire chapter, laying out these cunningly devised fables and the people who have perpetrated these things and why they did them. We have not followed follow cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and coming, the personal presence of our Lord Yeshua Messiah, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He goes on, he says, for we received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. When he said, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased, he takes us right back to that mountaintop. On Yom Kippur, when the Almighty said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, the second of three times that there is a voice from heaven, and he says, in this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with them in the Holy Mount. We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed. He's saying, just like we heard the voice from heaven then, the word that I'm speaking to you now, he says, is that word from heaven. I am instructing you before I die so that you are not taken hostage, so that you are not led about by these pseudo propheticos these false prophets, you do well to take heed. Because it's like a light that shines into the darkness. And it's, it's a light that shines until the day dawns. And, and, and this is, you know, it, it's, a, it's a light. It's not the day dawning light. It's not Yeshua coming back light. It's enough so that we understand this. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen, knowing this first, here is that light. This is like this, this, this very bright flashlight that shines, shines in the darkness that we need in this age. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture, no foretelling, nothing that came out, no prophecy is of any idios epilusos, of any private interpretation, of one's own letting loose. It doesn't matter what anyone thinks, it matters what the Almighty says. That's what it means. For the prophecy, the word of God, came not at any time by the will of man. Somebody just doesn't make it up. But the real word comes when holy men of God speak as they are breathed upon, pneumos, breathed upon by the Ruach Kodesh, the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit breathes on them and they speak, like David, the rock spoke to him and now he speaks. Like the, the, like the voice from heaven spoke and they all heard it. Peter heard it. It's the first time he's speaking about it. Just like that, what he is saying, I have heard from heaven, now I'm telling you, so that you are not destroyed. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, but conversely, there were false prophets among the people then in Israel, even as there are gonna be false teachers among you, who privately, who surreptitiously, who, who behind the scenes bring in damnable heresies. They deny the Lord that bought them, and they're gonna bring upon themselves swift destruction. Because these people need to be handled with an iron glove, with the long end of a spear. Because they're the sons of Belial, as it says in Revelation, you've tried those who say they are sent ones and they're not. They're jokers. They're liars. Good job. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Many, many believers are, are just going to be led away by them by reason of whom the way of truth is going to be eventually be spoken of. 
and through covetousness because of what they can earn off you. They are going to just make up stuff in order to make merchandise of you. They're, they're, they're going to make it up. And we hear so much of that going on nowadays. Feigned words. We hear it on Christian television. Oh, send us your offering because we're going to take the word of God. We're going to take the gospel of the kingdom out to the world. And you, you can listen to them for 10 years and you'll never hear the gospel of the kingdom come out of their mouth because they wouldn't know the gospel of the kingdom of if the king came up and slapped him side the head on the street. Wouldn't know the gospel of the kingdom. No idea what it is. Feigned words mer make merchandise of you. Oh, listening just this uh, last week to someone who said, well, in the Hebrew thought, this means this. And then he goes and butchers the Hebrew words completely to pieces. Actually, it was sent to me by some folks in Israel and, say, and they said, this guy is absolutely insane. We grew up speaking Hebrew. This guy is the biggest liar we've ever heard. And it's like, and they wanted me to analyze. I don't have time to analyze it. You already did. What does he do it for? He's doing it to make merchandise of them. But all you have to do is speak some Hebrew words and say, in Hebrew thinking, it means this. And, and you got all these Gentiles that just lap it up like dogs out there. Because it's new, it's something different, it's something they hadn't heard in Sunday school yet. But I'll tell you, their judgment is not going to linger long. Their damnation is not going to slumber. That's what Peter said. See, there are things that, that have to be understood with the gravity with which the Scripture gives it to us. And now I want to take you to the words of David, but these are about the last words of Moses. And to do this, we need to go back to Psalm. Psalm, the 103rd Psalm. The 103rd Psalm, give you a moment to get there. Oh, this is beautiful. Bless Yahovah, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name, which is Yahovah. Bless Yahovah, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. And what are the benefits? The benefits are, as he says, you benefit, you are blessed if you obey him, if you keep his commandments. He forgives all of our iniquities. He heals all of our diseases. He redeems thy life from destruction. He crowns you with loving kindness in his tender mercies. Who satisfies thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. This is it's a beautiful verse here because the, the eastern eagle in its waning years gets so feeble, his wings get so heavy, so difficult that it is almost grounded in the eagle. To renew its strength, it flies high into the sky and then takes a death dive and plunges into the water, ripping its feathers off from him. He then gets to shore and then molts the rest of his feathers and then his feathers start growing back on. And as his plumage then becomes full, he can then take off and soar into the heavens for one last season of its life. Thy youth is renewed like the eagles. I take that as a promise to me. Strip of everything, every bit of energy and strength gone, without heroic intervention, wouldn't have made it another month. But yet, the Almighty intervened, and with heroic intervention, and thanks to Israeli inventions, my youth has been renewed like the eagles. He satisfied my mouth with good things because it is his word, his righteousness and judgment that has liberated me because I was oppressed. I grew up oppressed by religion and he set me free. In verse seven, a very precious, a very exceeding precious promise. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. See, and we're going to see as Moses lays out 
his ways. And what was done in the temple to remember his ways as they were revealed unto Moses. Because at the time we only saw his acts, the children of Israel, we saw what the Almighty did, but we didn't understand why he did it, not until Moses gives us his last words. Verse eight, we're going to continue. Yehovah is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He's not always going to chide with us, though he does at times. Neither, neither will he keep his anger forever, and yes, he does get angry. But he has not dealt with us after our sins. He has not rewarded us according to our iniquities. See, the Almighty is, is loving. He is kind. He understands who we are. We, we see that the terminology in what Israel so many times got into was attributing maleficent intent to a loving God. Did you bring us out here into this wilderness to kill us? And they chode with Moses. They were assigning to the Almighty maleficent intent, as if he brought us out in order to kill us. They, he parted the Red Sea in order so he could really kill us. See, that is blasphemy. That is attributing maleficent intent to our loving Heavenly Father. You know, there are things that we deserve judgment on, but yet, as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. All you have to do is bow the knee, and confess the sin. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. He's like a father, a father who pities and loves his children. Just, he just loves them so much, so Yahovah, he loves those just like little children that fear him. He knows our frame. He knows that we're nothing but dust. He knows, as we know, that our days are just like grass just like the flower of the field. Grows up, wind passes over it, and it's gone. And where it was, it's not remembered. But what is remembered, the mercy of Yahovah is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And his righteousness unto children's children. To such as keep his covenant. And that's to whom it is addressed, to those that keep his covenant. And those that remember his commandments and do them. Everything that is spoken all hinges upon this. These are the ones that love and respect him. Those that keep his covenant, those that remember his commandments and actually do them. Yahweh has prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. So bless Yahweh. Bless Yahweh his angels that excel in strength far beyond us. Bless Yehovah, those that do his commandments and hearken unto the voice of his word. Bless Yehovah, all his host, his armies in heaven and below. Ye ministers of him that do his pleasure, bless Yehovah, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless Yehovah, O oh my soul. Now we are going to see the famous last words of Moses. We are going to see that he made known his acts to the children of Israel, but he made known his ways unto Moses. We're going to take a short break first, and this is the time. I'm going to give you an opportunity, maybe your last opportunity, to give. Support this ministry. If this is ministry to you, I'll give you an opportunity now.
recorded in the book of Deuteronomy, or Sefer Devarim, Sefer which is a book, uh, Devarim which is short for Vela HaDevarim, uh, which is the first words. It's literally, these are the words. And these are the words of Moses just before he dies. This is one message that he delivers to the children of Israel who are all gathered together just before going into the promised land. And I'm going to take you to the very end of this book in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and in verse 7. Verse 7, we read, And Moses called under, unto Yehoshua, or Jesus, it's the same word, it's Yehoshua, Yeshua, and said unto him, In the sight of all Israel. And so this is the public ordination. Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with his people under the land, or into the land, which Yehovah has sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. Moses is not going over. He broke the prophetic shadow picture of striking the rock a second time instead of declaring it. And so now he is commissioning Joshua, Yehoshua, to lead the people into the promised land. In Yehovah, he it is that goes before you. He's with you. He's not going to fail you. He's not going to forsake you. Do not fear. Do not be discouraged. And Moses wrote this law, this Torah, this entire thing, that, that the entire book of Deuteronomy, he wrote it all down. These are the words, his last words. He wrote it and he delivered it to the priests, the sons of Eli, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of Yahovah. And he delivered it to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, the Shemitah, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all of Israel comes up to appear before Yahovah in the place that he shall choose, then you shall read this Torah before all Israel in their hearing. He's not talking about Genesis through Devarim, he's speaking of Devarim, that the entire thing is to be heard every seventh year. He said to gather the people together, the men, the women, and the children, and the stranger that's in your gates, so that they may hear, and that they may learn, and that they may fear Yehovah, and that they may observe, even the stranger in their gates, the Gentiles that have joined themselves to Israel, to guard and to do all the words of this law, this Torah. This would be well for us to do in the Christian world so that we will no longer be anomia, that we will no longer just be helter-skelter so that we have some kind of foundation, not just ever-changing rules of our denomination. Get them together and read the entire word of this Torah, the book of Deuteronomy. His words, Moses' famous last words. And he says to do this, that their children, which have not known anything, may hear. Because if they were born, and then seven, six years later in their life is the seventh year, at six years of age, they're going to hear it. And then every seven years after that, they are going to hear, and they will learn to fear Yehovah. As long as you live in this land, that is what you're going to do. You will go up to the place he puts his name, and that is where you are going to rehearse these things. We're going to go back to the beginning of Deuteronomy. Not to the very beginning, which I already gave you the first few words, but Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1, Deverine. Moses called Israel, all of Israel, and said unto them. Now he's going to start laying it out. He gave the background, and he says, Shema, Yisrael. Shema, hear and obey, Israel. Hear and obey the statutes and judgment which I speak into your ears this day, that you may learn them and guard them 
and do them. And then he begins to tell a story that is unique to planet Earth. Yehovah, our God, made a covenant with us at Horeb. He did not make this covenant with our forefathers, but with us, even us. You who are all alive here right now, right this day, just before I die, just before you go over the Jordan River, just before you go take Jericho, just before you go over there and circumcise because you haven't done it in 40 years and keep Passover for the first time since we left Mount Sinai 40 years earlier, you were there at that mountain. Yehovah spoke with you face to face. Out of the mount, right out of the midst of this flaming fire, and I stood between Yehovah and you at that time because you were afraid because of the fire. And you were afraid to go up close to the mountain. And you, you said to us, and I'll, I'll just go from memory, you know, Moses, Moses, we're afraid we're going to die. I'm taking you right back to Exodus chapter 20. We're afraid you're going to die. After the 10th commandment was shouted down, we're afraid we're gonna die. You go up into the mountain, please, and the Almighty, whatever he tells you, you come back down and tell us, and we promise we'll obey. We are afraid we're going to die. And so I went up into the mountain. But that's the day that the Almighty spoke with you and said, and he repeats, I am Yahovah thy Elohim. And he repeats the 10 statements that were made at Mount Sinai. And finally he gets down, in six days you'll labor and do thy work. And why I'm skipping to that one is because it's repeated over and over and over in Moses' last words. Six days you work. Six days work. But the seventh is a Sabbath of Yehovah. In it, you'll not going, you're not going to do any work. Neither you, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your ox, your ass, any of your cattle, or the stranger that is in your gates, because they are under the same Torah. So that, and you're gonna do this, you're gonna rest so that your man, your maidservant is gonna rest just as well as you do. And remember, and remember on that day that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, you got no day off. None of the world got a day off at that time. And even Israel has been criticized through the ages that uh, they're lazy, they take a day off. Well. They get a day out because the Almighty will keep them and will cause them to prosper even if they do not put their nose to the grindstone to be a, a, a consumer and a taxpayer every single day of their living life. And he said, Yahweh brought you out with a mighty hand. He brought you out of Egypt and he commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. At Mount Sinai in the 23rd chapter, this is after Moses goes up, after the commandments are shouted down, and the people says, you go up in the mountain, you know, whatever the Almighty tells you, you tell us and come back down and tell us. His closing statements, just before he comes back down, the Almighty reiterates what he did in, in great detail when he shouted it down. He said, six days, you shall do work, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest. Your ox and your ass, they need to rest. Your, the, the son of your handmaid, the stranger, everyone needs to be refreshed. And all these things that I've said to you, be circumspect, inspect, circum, circumference, watch all the way around you, be careful. Do not make mention of the name of other gods. Don't let it be heard out of your mouth. I don't want to hear anything about Easter Sunday, okay? I don't want that, 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 that witch of Babylon to be remembered. I want her name to be blotted out. Easter, may her name be blotted out. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear their names mentioned. I don't want them in my face. I don't want you to learn the way of the heathen. I want you to be holy to me. Well, 
This, this is the very same thing that, that Moses reiterates uh, to the, in, in Leviticus, the instructions of the Levites. It says in Leviticus chapter 23, concerning the feast of the Lord, it says, in Yahweh I've spoken to Moses saying, you speak to the children of Israel and tell them this. Tell them this concerning the feast of Yahovah. They are not the feast of the Jews. They're not the feast of Israel. They're my feast. They belong to me. And you shall proclaim them to be Kadosh Mikra, holy rehearsals, holy convocations, holy rehearsals. Now we knew that they rehearsed and remembered good things that happened in the past, but until after Yeshua fulfilled the spring feast, it could never be spoken that these are holy rehearsals of prophetic shadow pictures of good things to come. He said, these are my feast, in case you, you don't get it. In case you want to call them your feast, these belong to me. They're holy rehearsals, they belong to me, and this is how we're going to do it. First of all, six days will work be done. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You're not going to do any work therein. It is the Sabbath of Yehovah in all of your dwellings. So that's where it all starts out, ladies and gentlemen, reiterated over and over and over in Deuteronomy. But now I want to take you deeper into the last words of Moses. Because here is where Moses is going to reiterate the importance of not only the Sabbath, but also the feast of the Lord and why they are so important and why he told us to keep them forever. And so please go to Deuteronomy chapter 16 and in verse 1. Observe the month of Abib, it says in your King James Version. Bad translation because the word observe is shamar, which is to guard. It is to guard like the guard at the gate of a fortress. Guard the month of the Aviv, it says in Hebrew. Now when you see Aviv, anytime you see a B in a Hebrew word, in the body of it, it is normally, just about every time, it is pronounced as a vet instead of a bet, okay? It's not Elizabeth, it's Elisheva, okay? It's not Abib, it's Aviv. And so when it says to guard the month of the Aviv, it does it for a reason, because it's not the month of Abib. There's no month called Abib. As a matter of fact, Aviv is an ancient Hebrew agricultural term that defines the level of maturity of barley. That is what it is. It, re, it is associated completely with and only with barley. Maturity of a very important crop in the land of Israel, the poor man's crop, barley. And when the barley is aviv in the spring, that's the time it's harvested, and that, after the first fruit offering is made, that is the first time that even the poor get to eat of that year's barley. So until that first fruit offering is done, it's not the month of the, uh, uh, until it's aviv, it's not the month of the aviv. Well, we're going to continue on, because this is a commandment. Guard the month of the aviv, and keep the Passover under Yehovah thy Elohim. Now, you notice in your King James Version, the word Passover here is not capitalized. It's a proper noun. It's not capitalized, and yet they capitalized Aviv, which is just a term that relates to barley. See, that's why theology, the theology of the translators gets into this. They want to minimize the feast of the Lord. They're his feast, every one, every, almost every letter should be capitalized because they belong to Almighty God, all right? You try to minimize it, yeah, good luck. It's not going to work. To those, he says, out of my sight, I don't know you. You don't respect me, you don't honor me, you don't fear me, you don't keep my commandments. Broad path, you know where it goes. Adios, amigos, Yeshua says in Spanish to even those who speak English. He says, keep, keep, keep the Passover. For in the month of the Aviv, Yehovah, thy Elohim, brought you forth out of Egypt by night. 
Now let's go back to that time in Egypt. Why is this the month of the Aviv? It tells us that one of the plagues, one of the most vicious plagues, that in Exodus chapter nine, verse 24, it says that there was a hail. There was a great hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the flax and the barley were smitten. They were destroyed because the barley was in the ear. The words in the ear in Hebrew are the, the barley was of Eve. What is this? The barley was in the ear. That doesn't make any sense at all. The barley was in the ear. The translators didn't know what this ancient Hebrew agricultural term meant. And the best way to define it is the barley was aviv. Just use the word because it's going to be defined in the scripture. So the barley was aviv. When we were in Egypt, the hail destroyed the barley and we came out of Egypt in that very month. Now, we're going to continue on here in uh, Exodus chapter 12. Jehovah spoke unto Moses and Aaron while we were still in the land of Egypt, and this is before the Passover was eaten. And he said, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, and then he goes on and continues how to Passover will be done in the future once we enter the land. We haven't even kept the Passover yet. We're still in Egypt, but yet the Almighty says that this is going to be rehearsed in the future. This is a Kadosh Mikra. We are going to do it on into the future. This is what we're going to do. But even before then, he said, this is the first, the beginning of months. It is the month when the barley is of Eve. Continue on, Deuteronomy 16, 2. We're back in, in chapter 16. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the lowercase Passover. Now, put a big P in your Bibles there. Sacrifice the Passover, the feast of Yehovah. You'll fast sacrifice the Passover unto Yehovah the Elohim. Fast sacrifice it from the flock and from the herd. Flock means sheep, herd means goats in this case. It's either it's a male lamb of the first year, the sheep or goats. And you shall do it in the place where Yehovah shall choose to put his name there. For 400 years, it was Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle was. And then David, by revelation, moved it to Jerusalem. And that's where it was. It says, you shall not eat any leavened bread with the Passover that you sacrificed on the 14th day. In seven days, you're going to eat unleavened bread, which is the bread of affliction because you came out of Egypt in haste. And that is why during that seven days you're gonna remember, 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 remember the day that you came out of Egypt. You're gonna remember it all the days of your life. You're gonna do this forever. And there's not gonna be any leavened bread that's seen in all of your borders for that seven days. Neither shall any of the flesh which you sacrifice the first day at evening, remain un all night until the morning. That's the Passover. See, what we do now, we don't, si we don't sacrifice the Passover, okay? And, and it goes on to tell us that. It says that you may not, you may not, you may not sacrifice the Passover within any of your own gates, which Yahweh gives you. Not in Philadelphia, not in Perea, not in Tiberias, not in Texas. You are only to sacrifice the Passover at the place which Jehovah shall choose to put his name there. That is the only place you sacrifice the Passover. You're gonna do it at even, at the going down of the sun. Doesn't specify, you know, once the sun starts going down, it doesn't specify there. That's why we're given the flexibility. That's why during the second temple period, there were, at the time of Yeshua, about a quarter million lambs that were sacrificed. It was done in the late afternoon. Even today, the Samaritan priest will say that it has to be done just after sunset and then before it gets completely dark. But when do they do it? They do it in the afternoon because there's so many lambs that have to be sacrificed up on Mount Gerizim, they still do it today up there, that they start in the afternoon, even though they said, you know, originally it was supposed to be done back then. So it just says at the going down of the sun. Doesn't mean when it hits, it just says at the going down of the sun. 
and you're gonna do it at the season you came forth out of Egypt. What is the season we came out of Egypt? In the month of the Aviv barley. And you shall roast it and eat it in the place where Yahweh shall choose. And you shall turn in in the morning and go into your tents. In another place it tells you you had to burn everything, there's nothing to be left of it. That's for the Passover lamb. And that is why on the Orthodox Seder plate they have a broken shank bone of a lamb on the Passover plate and they don't serve lamb on that day because they are saying a broken shank bone of a lamb, this is not Passover, we're not to break one bone of the lamb and so this is a designation that this is not Passover. At our Passover event, we serve lamb, and we make it very clear, this is not Passover. We are celebrating, we're remembering Passover. Do we eat it the next day? Do we have to burn it all? No, because it's not the Passover lamb. And it continues on, six days, you shall eat all of an eleven bread. On the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly to Yahweh the Elohim. You shall do no work therein. So at the very beginning is a high Sabbath. At the end, and that's when we eat the lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. After sunset, at the end of the 14th, when the sun sets, it's now the 15th. That's a high holy day. And then the very next, uh, at the end of it, seven days later, is a holy convocation. Now, back to Leviticus 23, because Moses is, is gonna fill us in with more detail on this. These are the feasts of Yehovah, even holy convocations, even Kadosh Mikra, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. And they have to be done according to the Aviv. This is why the scripture says to guard the month of the Aviv. It's the first month of the year. If you don't have that right, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have the creator's calendar. You've got something that was made up. Most of the time it's made up 359 of the common era by the rabbis. They made up a calendar and they said, this is what we're gonna keep until the Messiah comes. Well, sorry, to give you the news, but the Messiah already came and he said, do not follow the takanot of the Pharisees. When they make a law which changes the biblical law, don't follow them. The Torah still stands, ladies and gentlemen, and those who do not guard the month of the Aviv, they're not Hebrew roots. They're playing games. They're playing you know, Jewish roots, they get a little Judaism here, a little Judaism there. They want you to do the, the, uh, the Amidah and the Shakrit, and they say, oh, this is what we did in the temple. No, they're, they're, they're idiots. It was not done in the temple. These things were all invented by the Pharisees after the temple was destroyed. Yeshua said, don't follow them. And what do they have you doing? Oh, just watch your Jewish root stuff on the television. Just watch your Hebrew root stuff on the television out there and you'll see such a mixture. So much leaven is in this, it is almost unredeemable at this point, ladies and gentlemen, unless the Almighty comes down and just starts taking care of business. Moses continue, in the 14th day of the first month, at evening, even, that is Yahweh's Passover. On the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto Yahweh. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread, matzah. In the first day you'll have a holy convocation. You're not gonna do any servile work therein. There is work to be done, but no servile work. And you're gonna offer an offering made by fire, and this is what's going to be in the temple. Seven, and on the seventh day, it's a holy convocation, and you shall do no servile work therein. Three times a year you shall keep a feast unto me in the year. You shall keep a feast, the feast of unleavened bread. You'll eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you. And the appointed time in the month of the Aviv, for in it, for in the month of Aviv you came out from Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. This is the foundation of the Creator's calendar his reckoning of time, what we are given at Mount Sinai. When Moses went up and received the commandments that he came down and wrote on a scroll, he said three times a year, you're gonna come up. You then, we entered into the blood covenant. Moses, in reiterating, gives us the ways of the Almighty. This is how you do it, ladies and gentlemen. This is how you do it. You guard the month of the Aviv. When the barley's of Eve, that's the first month, that's when you have Passover. 
and then. And that's why we always celebrate and schedule our Passover for the earliest possible time the barley can be aviv. If it turns out the barley's not aviv, we'll still join together, celebrating together, and then we'll do it at home with our families the next month. But that sets the standard, and that is where we're going to go. The standard is set by Moses in his last words. I like to pray. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Amen, amen. Shabbat shalom to our fans, Shavuot tov. Have a good week and we'll see you back here for Shabbat Night Live. If you'd like to learn more about or place an order for Michael Rood's dynamic four-disc, four-episode teaching series, Famous Last Words, just go to our online store at www.arudawakening.tv forward slash best of or call 888-766-3610. done yet you got to subscribe if you want to see more of this stuff just click the button up here better yet you can click here to watch more right now and if you like what you see support what we do donate here to keep the broadcast coming thank you